Order, order. Good morning and welcome to this morning's meeting of the Women and Equality Select Committee and our inquiry into the rights of older people. Can I thank our witnesses this morning for joining us? We have Jonathan Boyes, Senior Labour Market Economist at the CIPD, Natalie Hall, Chief Strategy Officer at 55 Redefined, Nicholas Smith, the Head of Rights at Social, Social and Economics at the TUC, and Professor Wendy Loretto, Dean and Professor of Organisation Behaviour at the University of Edinburgh Business School, who's joining us from Prague, however, I believe, via Zoom. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, members of the committee will ask you questions in turn, but if at any point any of you wish to come in or add anything, please indicate, and I will endeavour to bring you in at an appropriate moment. Could we just start off, and I'm sorry, I'm going to direct this to Jonathan first of all. Look, throughout the course of this inquiry, we've heard various witnesses give an indication that socially it's almost acceptable to discriminate against people on the grounds of age, that we will still treat it as if it's okay to dismiss somebody's thoughts, opinions, views just because they're older. We recognise that it absolutely is not. But could you tell us whether ageism is also accepted when it comes to recruitment? Sure. So um, CRPD has made guidance for inclusive recruitment of, of older workers mm -hmm. with Centre for Ageing Better and the Recruitment Employment Confederation. And it's essentially it's five things. And number one is to put age into EDI. So I suppose that's the recognition that other uh, protected characteristics are you know, a very explicit part of EDI strategies, but age can be overlooked. So that's our, our number one of our five things. Um, within our guidance, there is uh, some, we cite some research also from the Centre for Ageing Better, um, some good statistics here so, uh, that suggest that, yes, um, there is a lot of age bias. So um, over a third of people in their 50s and 60s feel at a disadvantage in applying for jobs. Meanwhile, 17% say they've experienced ageism directly, having been turned down for a job because of their age, and nearly a third, 29%, have been told they were unlikely to be successful going for a job uh, due to having too much experience. Um, so I think we can conclusively say yes, there's bias. So you put it in your guidance. Do you, um, do you monitor how much employers take heed of your guidance? Uh, well, I mean, we have stats on downloads and that sort of thing. Um, I think that... There's, there's an interesting thing about, you know, what can legislators do and, you know, how much is norms and cultural practices. And I think that's probably a bigger role in influencing businesses, sort of changing uh, perspectives and, and the status quo of how things have already, all, always been done. Um, it's very interesting that in the past, in the sort of post-financial crash era, because we had a jobs boom, unemployment came down so much, that did a lot of the heavy lifting, I feel, for getting older people into work. And um, to an extent, I think we probably all took our eye off the ball a bit. And then along came COVID and we suddenly had like a, a lot more exit, early exit from the labour market. And we're worried again. And we have to think more consciously about strategies to improve and, in, you know, to lengthen um, working lives. Natalie, do you have anything that you can add to that? Please? I would very much, I suppose, um, align with the, the views of Jonathan. Um, we see that there are barriers at every stage of the recruitment process, actually, both from um, an individual perspective about how they feel about applying for a job, but also through actual recruitment processes. So if I take the recruitment processes, um, it could be as simple as where the roles are advertised. So from our research, many employers will advertise roles on LinkedIn, but only 16% of over 50s are active on LinkedIn, so they're not seeing the opportunities. Um, secondly, it can be the language that's used within those role descriptions, anything from energetic to dynamic to early careers can all be off-putting for an older worker. We also see imagery, so if we look across many, many of our clients and we look at their careers pages, that's one of the first things we do, we often see no older people featured in, in the imagery, or if they are, they don't look like over 50s, they look like over 80s. Um, we also see that the process doesn't work for many over 50s either. So from our research, we know that over 50s sometimes need up to eight touch points through an through application process to be successful in um, achieving a role. But applicant tracking systems, the automation of the recruitment process doesn't align for that either. Um, and we also have from our research, which I think is fascinating, that actually the experience of an over 50s applicant for roles is very much driven by the age of the recruiter. So there's, there's a, nearly a 40% swing in whether a, a candidate is successful in achieving a role, mm. depending on, on the age of a recruiter. So um, from a 25 to 30-year-old to a 46 to 50-year-old, that's a 40% swing. So attitudes are around ageism are definitely inherent within our um, work, workplaces. Thank you. Nicola, you were nodding at that. 
I, I thought it was an interesting observation. I um I don't have enormous amount to add to what others have said. Our views in this area are that some of the changes that would make recruitment more inclusive for everybody would also do much to reduce the amount of age-related discrimination that older workers face when they apply for jobs. So specifically around about flexible working, making sure that all adverts note that flexible working options are available and that that's available by default by normalising working practices that will benefit older workers who are more likely to have health conditions or caring responsibilities than many others in the workplace. It becomes easier for people to both see roles to identify that they could do them and to apply for them and by removing um, age-related information around job applications in the same way that employers are increasingly seeking quite rightly to remove other um, information that identifies particular personal characteristics you know again you you get better outcomes in your recruitment because you're recruiting on the basis of people's fit for the job rather than particular characteristics that that they may that they may have thank you and wendy Thank you. Yes, I just to I'm um, absolute support what's already been said from our own research. Just to add a couple of points, and I think these maybe will run through everything we talk about today is the homogenisation, and you know there's homogenisation obviously in terms of age over 50s. It's a huge category, isn't it? I mean, what other sort of you know 25 potentially 25 year age span in the career would we think of as just one one group? So there is a big difference. I think, for example, going back to where you know vacancies are advertised between say people who are 50 and just over who might be on, on internet sources and then those who are, who are maybe in their 60s. So I think age does play a big difference in that and we should be thinking more heterogeneity. The other area is that, again, what we've found is that it's not an equal playing field. We know that in employment more generally. Um, so the, if you've got um, older workers who are you know, more like professional, white collar, they have had development in their careers, if they're looking for other jobs, Recruitment is not so much of a barrier as them. There may still be ageism, I absolutely grant that, but they, they're more equipped. But a, a lot of the people that we're talking about who have fallen out of employment are not those um, fortunate um, you know, professional white collar who have been invested in or people who have maybe been out of employment for some time. They're, um, you know, they're, they, they are less, um, they, they have different skills, but they are, they are less able and less prepared to, to, to go into to recruitment. Thank you. Um, Coming back to you, Natalie, what do you think can be done to enforce more age-inclusive recruitment? Is this going to be a job for the Equalities and Human Rights Commission, or should it be somebody else who takes the lead? We, we've been supporting employers to become more age-inclusive with our own accreditation programme. So it's a bit of a carrot at the minute in, in a sense of um, what we're trying to um, encourage employers to recognise, that there's a huge business case around having older people in, in the workforce um, from a both kind of um, engagement, engagement scores and happiness at work perspective, both also from the fact that the, that the over 50s are the only growing talent pool, you know, with a shrinking birth rate and also the fact that there's going to be, you know, a large proportion of um, our population will be over 50 within the next... Um, 10 to 20 years. Therefore, actually, there's a huge business case around having over 50s in the workplace. Um, we support organisations, actually, from, from a number of perspectives, both in terms of um, recruiting over, over 50s workers, but also understanding those that they have in their workforce already and encouraging them to stay. So we do see that there's a huge drop-off in engagement with a lot of employers for, in their over 50 population. They don't feel invested in, they don't feel particularly engaged with. And actually, there's a huge opportunity there for employers to re-engage with, with that population population and not see that level of attrition or um, rehiring costs when those individuals leave. Um, you know, from a stats perspective, from our research, we've found that an over 50s worker is 200% less likely to take a day off sick than an under 30. So from a productivity perspective, it's, it's fantastic to have over 50s in your workforce. Um, also, as over 50s, um, emotional intelligence tends to rise with age. So having, emotion, having over 50s in your workforce um, makes for a better coaching and mentoring atmosphere for those uh, in the team. Um, and they're also, um, also less, less likely to um, leave within the first 12 months of hiring. And you described it as a carrot, not a stick. Have you, can you provide us with any evidence of its efficacy? Um, we are, we are, see, you know, we, we are an organisation that's been going two years, and so therefore we have, um, so far, kind of a number of employers who are into their second years of, of accreditation. What we are seeing already is an improvement in engagement scores from those over 50s, from those employers. We're also seeing that they are getting fantastic results through um, the recruitment activity. Um, and I suppose just to give you a, a little case study, we've been working with a UK insurer who wanted to run a pilot around um, hiring some over 50s into a contact centre because they believed. Um, 
um, the hypothesis that if they were able to mirror match their employee demographic with their consumer demographic, they would get better outcomes. And what we, what we um, hired for them on a pilot, they wanted to hire six roles. They actually made 16 offers in the end to our over 50s candidate pool. And they said they were the best role players they've ever experienced. And now they're the highest performing um, contact centre individuals in, in their workforce in, that, in this location. Um, but for me, it's the personal story. So there was one individual that was hired through that programme who had never had a, a career in insurance. Um, and she'd never also had an occupational pension. And she was 62. Thank you. Jonathan, does the CAIPD have any great initiatives that encourage employers to recruit the over 50s? Um, well, I, I shared with you that we have guidance for inclusive recruitment uh, and the, the first thing was to put age into EDI. I'll just quickly um, read off the other thought four um, things. So know your numbers is what we suggest employers do. That just means knowing the proportion of people at different ages in your organisation. I, as an analyst at CIP, I sort of do that work myself and compare it to the general population. It's fascinating. It's very simple analysis and it told us that we were kind of quite peaked in the middle age with less people at the top and the bottom. Uh, so HR immediately think about how they can remedy that. So we might do more apprenticeships to bring young people in, that sort of thing. And, you know, really simple analysis that quickly turns into an insight that then actions through recruitment to change things. Um, De-bias your job adverts. We've already talked a little bit about that. The language used, the imagery used. There's a great initiative by the Centre for Aging Better, which was they created open source age inclusive images that people can use. Um, check your processes. So this is about um, reducing explicit cues for age, you know, things like even asking for age. And number five was build awareness and confidence. And I feel that um, a lot of what we're talking about today will, you know, hopefully the passage of time, just a, a larger number of older workers and a larger number of people who are, you know, familiar with these concepts should start to change things over time. Like I say, it's when we talk about the business case for older workers, one of the really basic business cases, without talking about all the benefits of people who are specifically older, is that um, businesses need people. Unemployment's really low, inactivity's high, uh, and, you know, it's the... The, the, the more marginal workers, those who are further away from the labour market, where you have to work harder to get them in, uh, and that includes older workers. So I, I'm sort of hopeful that we're going to see more positive um, engagement from businesses in this, just because it really is in their interest to, um, to solve this problem. Is that the way forward, that it should all be carrot, no stick? Uh, I'd, I'd say more carrot than stick. You know, there is uh, age is protected characteristic under the um, the Equality Act, so um, you know there should be recourse to um, for, to hold an employer to account if they um, break the rules there. Um, but um, realistically, the more uh, carrot is probably the better way to go for the majority of businesses. Uh, and yeah, where, where, where I see things going. And like I say, I think I genuinely believe it's a win-win um, just because businesses are just so desperate for people at the moment. I was going to say, you only have to look at the labour market to see if you've got to find talent. You'll have to start looking at us oldies. Uh, Leah. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, with regard to training um, and development at work, Wendy, if I could just ask you a question. You know, we've, we've heard that older workers tend to be the least likely to, to take on training and be developed to, you know, further at work. And what does your research suggest is, is driving what's going on there? Yeah, like, like a lot of these things, there's no one um, driver, but I think a very big driver is the fact that um, they, they, they simply get ignored. And that can be uh, not for, for bad reasons from an employer perspective. And what we're finding from a whole range of um, it's a qualitative work in this area, but qualitative, robust qualitative work with big numbers and over a range of employers at sectors is that employers are frightened of raising the issues because they then could be seen to be discriminating on grounds of age. And I think what has happened is it, employers have um, retracted uh, from talking about retirement uh, because they're they're worried, uh, as I say, about being seen as age discriminatory. And they've not replaced what maybe they used to do, which might have been some really good um, future planning. Uh, they, they've just simply got a vacuum there. Whereas, um, and the talk, you know, from DWP, et cetera, around midlife MOT is actually saying we should be having conversations with workers of every age. But particularly as we move through the phases and what our later life working, which, again, maybe many years uh, might entail. And that is not actually ages. That's just good, a part of good people management 
to be having developmental conversations with people regularly, but are tailored towards the stage of career and indeed stage of life that they might be at. So, you know, what, what we found is a real disconnect. Employers not wanting to fall foul of the legislation, but ending up ignoring their older workers and older workers who do still think about retirement and do still think about their wider lives, um, just feeling that they're ignoring me, therefore they don't value me, therefore they themselves um, withdraw mentally, if not um, more than that, if not physically, and in fact, ultimately leave work. So I think that's that's one of the big reasons we see the lack of um, training and development. There is undoubtedly ageism here. And and that can be, as uh, going back to what Natalie said earlier, that can be on behalf of the employer that simply they think, you know, X is too old to engage in, say, training on a new IT system simply because of their age. But also the employee will, will discriminate against themselves. And that internalised ageism, I think, is, is absolutely rife. It affects everything from recruitment, training, development, retention, etc. And that's one absolutely, I think, one characteristic around age that differentiates it from the other protected characteristics. We're more likely to discriminate against ourselves on our grounds of our age. And that is a big barrier to training and development opportunities as well. So I'll leave it there. There probably is more I could say, but um, I think those are two main ones. Well, that is fascinating because you're obviously identifying both sides, the, the employer mm. and also the, the older worker and, and sort of maybe, you know, ingrained stereotypes and perhaps lower expectations um, yeah. culturally for the older worker. I mean, interestingly, I think it also mirrors women in the workplace. Obviously, we're not here to talk necessarily just about, about women, but, but um, uh, that uh, inability of employers or unwillingness or fear to talk about life cycles. You know, we're all going to get old. We're all going to you know, have caring responsibilities, whatever they may be. So, um, so I mean, what, what kind of, of things do you think that, you know, employers and employees need to be starting to do? Is, is it having, trying to have those conversations, making sure that there are annual um, appraisals, that kind of thing in the workplace? Absolutely. So we've been doing some work with Age Scotland, um, obviously part of, you know, the Age UK uh, umbrella of organisations and we've been doing some training with line managers. We've uh, reached just about 1,100 line managers across Scotland and part of that training is exactly, you know, just going right back to the basics and saying you can have these conversations, they are not inherently ageist and this is the way that you might want to, to try these. So actually taking that, um, taking that fear away from, you know, very often well-intentioned people or people who haven't thought about it as well, just this is how you can do it. So I think that is that is absolutely a way you've got to go in. I can say a bit more later, but I think we do need to acknowledge health. And, um, you know, while I absolutely agree that, you know, uh, it, that no one should be precluded from, you know, the talent and the experience and expertise they can provide just because of their age. The reality is that, um, you know, health problems do tend to um, get greater as as we age. And I think that needs to be part of it as well. But again, I'll, I'll come back to the health conversation later but it's really focusing on that whole worker it's 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 really thinking as, as you should do with a worker of any age isn't it about you know what what is it that drives you motivates you what are you able to do what do you want to do what do we want from you and having those conversations and removing the, the you know the psychological barrier very often to having those is, is paramount brilliant thank you I've also got a question for, for, for Nicola. The TU say, says that the problem is the access to, to older workers and that they're, they're not actually even being offered the training. I mean, where do you see that that, that, that problem is lying? What do you think is happening there? Well, I, I mean, I think to start with, we've been concerned for a number of years now about the really substantial cuts that there have been in spending on adult learning. Um, I think on current trends, government investment in skills is set to be a billion lower by 2025 than it was in 2010 in real terms. And research we've commissioned shows that there's been a really substantial decline in adult participation in further education and skills since 2010, um, with the number of learners more than halving over that time compared to 2021 to 2022. So the context is there is less money available to support people to train, and I think that has to be acknowledged up front. Um, we, the employers should be putting that funding in there as well. well what's the what's the reason? We think it's something. I mean, you know, there's there's clearly a need for a model that provides an employer and government settlement. There's the apprentice levy at the moment. There's a lot to talk about the important need to um, 
change the way that that model is, is working so that it's better incentivising the provision of skills to people who, who need them most. I mean, I think the issue there is mainly that far too many um, younger workers who need access to apprenticeships are, are losing out. But I think there's a question in the round about what the right model is for ensuring that employer contributions to skills are being made and then that that money is enabling, um, that then they're able to draw down access to government funds that target um, target their training at the groups who need them most, which would be most ensuring that young workers in entry-level jobs can gain access to work, but also the older workers who need to retrain or to consider access to retraining have got access to that, because of course not all older workers are in work. You know, a lot of people face a big problem of losing their job in their 50s, mid-50s, and then it's very, very difficult to get back into work, and a lack of government education I don't budget at that point makes it you know, impossible for people to access the training that would allow them to build up the skills to move into another job for um, a later career, career change, for example, or a different opportunity. Um, I think there's also issues in the workplace, as, um, as Wendy talked on, and we see this from union learning reps reporting to us, with people not, um, older workers being concerned to ask for training because they may not want their manager to know that they have skills needs. If you're working in an environment where you think there is going to be a risk to the way you are perceived, if you identify having a skills need and you think there's discrimination at play, you're less likely to ask for it. Um, and you may be, you, you may, because you can see the trends in your workplace, be quite, you know, quite right in assuming that you're more likely to be turned down than a younger colleague coming in and asking for skills needs. So, you know, we had previously, um, under um, the first few years, um, certainly the coalition and then the Conservative government, as well as under the previous Labour government, the Union Learning Fund, which you know delivered a really impressive return on investment for the Treasury, for employers, for employees, and allowed union learning reps in workplaces to work with individuals, to work with employers, to identify training need, to build confidence in making requests, and to support people to access learning. That, unfortunately, now has been removed entirely. Um, um, the whole fund has been cut and I think that was a really bad decision and the restoration of an approach to ensuring that in workplaces union learning reps can work with their colleagues to identify skills needs to work with employers to take away some of the um, some of the risk for the employees and also to help advocate for them and to work with employers to find and to plan what the skills need are was a really effective way of getting, you know, whether it was basic numeracy that people weren't willing to admit that they needed support with or whether it was more advanced skills, it was a really good way of leveraging that in in a way that was win-win. You say that, that that fund has been removed, but um, do the unions not continue to fund something like that? They, you know, they, they obviously have their own funds. Well, I mean, unions are funded by the um, affiliation fees paid by their members. So yes, of course, unions have their own funds, but nowhere like the scale of funding that would be available by a government minister union learning fund. I don't think it's reasonable to ask individual trade union members to pay for you know the entirety of the adult skills budget. Lovely, thank you. <clears throat> um, so a question for both you and, and Jonathan then. So what, to what extent do you think that, that there's a lack of access to and take up of of training and skills development and, and, and how is that preventing older workers from, from progressing at work? Um, yeah, sure, I can start. So uh, that, that it, there, at the moment there is a model which is that we do a lot of our education early, early in our lives, we sort of front load our human capital development and you know there's a sensible model and it's a, it's a rational way of doing things, not uh, in a world where we live as long as we do. Uh, and where our careers are as long as they are. Um, so we need to change something. But the costs of education are, they're, they're higher for older workers. Uh, I mean, one of the obvious costs, right, is the opportunity cost of lost earnings. When you're 18, you don't really make much money anyway. So three years at university. But if you're over 50 and you're professional and you've, you know, you're, you're making a decent amount of money, um, you can imagine that... Um, you know, a 50 grand salary, lost earnings for three years of an undergrad degree, for example, would just be 150 grand. That's huge compared to what it would cost. To, and then there's, you know, other disadvantages of it, it. It's simply more difficult. And a lot of the training is does not reflect um, that it needs to be different. You know, large chunks of training like a master's or an undergraduate degree, they're quite hard. I think we need more modular education, more further education, more um, more sort of evening classes and things like that. I myself have studied two degrees part-time and I've often, for, as an adult, and I've, I've sort of thought to myself, if, if 
Birkbeck University didn't exist, I, I wouldn't have this degree. There was no alternative to that. So things like Birkbeck and um, the Open University. If my employer had not been, um, you know, really accommodating in allowing me to work part-time hours whilst I attended classes, things like that. Um, so that requires a kind of cultural shift from employers, but also the provision. Like I said, if you don't live in a city like London and have an, an institution like that, or if there's not the Open University course doing it, then, um, then it becomes more difficult. Presumably, though, you know, on that basis, um, you know, I, I did my, my degree um, uh, while I was working, but that was because my employer saw that that was of, of great value to, to, you know, to me at work. I mean, what, what do you think that, um, you know, other things that, that would be valuable to, to get employers to, to look at that for, for older workers? Is it, is it perhaps those conversations of, you know, a cost-benefit analysis to their business of actually, you know, it, it's worth keeping good quality people and developing them for, for longer periods of time? I, think I, mean, I think there's a, a project we worked on that was a, um, an ESF-funded project that developed a sort of value my skills tool. And, you know, it's, it's probably broadly in line with some of what the government has been doing with setting up midlife career reviews and trying to create opportunities in workplaces for people to have a conversation about their skills and training needs. But what that found was that, you know, a part of the challenge to accessing skills in the workplace is, first of all, having that conversation, creating a space where people can talk about their future career path where an honest conversation what their strengths are but also what their skill needs might be but then crucially also having someone in the workplace with them who can act as a broker for thinking through well you know how do you make the training request how do we make the case for the business benefit that this might bring and how do we um, leverage in extra funding if that's what's needed and if that's available or how do we work with the employer to make the case to them for why they might fund it themselves so I think there's um, and again, that was you know a, a really positive way that union reps were supporting um, were supporting those conversations and were supporting you know with a win win outcome, which was that more people in work were talking about their skills needs, assessing them, but rather than just an online tool that people are sort of expected to work through on their own and then you know approach their employer for a possibly difficult conversation about, they have someone with them who can make the case, who can help them advocate, who can evidence you know the workplace benefit of of going ahead with this with this training. So I think that sort of approach that recognises that it's not always easy for individuals to have these conversations and you need a joined up, coordinated, planned approach within a workplace to how you're going to address training needs and involving unions in the workforce in doing that um, can bring real benefits. Do you think part, part of that actually is um, a lack of training for managers, for, for actually people managers to have these discussions? I mean, I'm, I'm sure that's the case because I know that across so much of um, what we do that you can see that improving people's understanding of employment law and their ability to comply with it and more widely their understanding of how to manage well is, is really important. But then, of course, I would add, you know, from, from my perspective and from the TUC's perspective, the legislation also matters and so does making sure that it's meaningly enforced. You know, we've talked a bit about carrot and stick um, and I would absolutely advocate for you know, the carrot approaches which provide people with the incentives and the support and the tools to have these conversations. But I also think in some areas we need stronger, stronger backstops. You know, so to go back, for example, to flexible working, um, it's great that we're now seeing the government bring that forward, that people have got a right to request from day one. You know, well, we think it should be a right to... Um, the presumption should be that all jobs could be, do flex, could be done flexibly from day one and there should be a requirement to advertise it and then you put the support alongside that to employers and to managers um, and you put good quality training in place and it's when you get that balanced approach together of the strengthened legislation of proper labour market enforcement to make sure it's happening and support in workplaces for people to do it well, that's when you get the really big shifts that make a big difference. And just finally from me, Wendy, um, obviously you've alluded to the uh, you know, midlife um, uh, interviews and discussions you know, that, that really employers sh should be having um, you know, with their employees, but, but we know that that, it, that really isn't happening and employers are stating that, it's, uh, that they're worried about falling foul of the Equality Act. I mean, you know, what, what's, can you describe the concerns that you've had about that and you know, they've had about that and, and how it arises and, and maybe what things we need to be looking at to try and, and solve this problem? Some of the concern is just through ignorance, and I think that that goes back to the education then that that you know several of us have spoken about. I think that's really important to say that there's not you're not going to fall file the Equality Act by having these conversations and and obviously education to how to have them appropriately and sensitively. 
I think some of it, if I'm being honest, is an excuse. Uh, I think that it it can be, it, you know, it, all of these conversations at any stage of, of a person's career life can be complicated. But I think, again, there, if I bring in the health aspect, uh, what we have found through the I'm Supporting Healthy Aging at Work project, the big project funded under the Healthy Aging Challenge, is that once you bring health needs into it, it gets even more complicated. And that could be because um, some of the health issues that are talked about are, are less easy. For example, menopause is a great example here where you have not not exclusively, but you maybe have younger male managers who do not feel comfortable about talking about menopause um, to, to you know, an older woman. Um, or it could be just um, some, again, it, it, you know, we've had we've had men with prostate issues, older men with prostate issues. And, you know, they feel that if they're having a career conversation, whether you, know, you label it as a midlife MOT or not, but having those conversations, those are very sensitive issues. They don't necessarily want to bring them up with their line manager. They're concerned that these issues will not just label them as ill, but label them as old and ill. <laughs> so you've got that double uh, double discrimination. So so I think the that while, you know, education to say it's not falling file of the and discrimination legislation is one thing i think it's a real sensitivity around the fact that these conversations may get more complicated because of health reasons as people get older not everybody not all older worker um will have health issues but we do know that ons statistics say that you know up to well it's probably now over a fifth of older workers who leave work early do so for unsupported health reasons so that that is a big chunk of the of the potential that we're we're looking at here. Thank you. For the rest of the panel, are you finding that that that's um, a reason for these discussions not happening? Uh, the employers saying that they're worried about falling foul of the Equality Act. Definitely, through every piece of research. Sorry, that was for the others, not for me. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's good. No. Um, Wendy, and is that is that something that any any of, you, of your organisations will come across? Yeah, I, I think I, I, absolutely, and I think for those conversations, work you need a willing and knowledgeable employer. And you need a willing employee, and you need and you need a protected a safe conversation where people feel supported in that. And what we're seeing is that the, the, the employers are not necessarily willing because they are concerned, and they are concerned about raising this as a as an issue and more worried about falling foul of the act. They're not the, the the people leaders who are having these conversations aren't trained in age conscious inclusion, for example. They don't know how to have these conversations in a in a productive way. Um, and also from a, an employee perspective, they're also not willing to put their hand up. So what we see is a, a huge amount of quiet quitting within the over 50s, slowly disengaging from work, not taking up the training and opportunities that are being offered, as you were just referring to, um, because actually they're, they're not feeling valued, they're not feeling seen at work, and therefore it's almost easier just to kind of like slowly disengage and, and, see, and um, work until the retirement date that they have in mind. Whereas actually what we want to advocate for is both sides um, be more knowledge about this as a topic and actually having more of a glide path into retirement. So not being afraid to have a conversation five years out to talk about what would you like it to look like? Can we look at flexible hours for you? Can we look at um, a change in your responsibility so you do more of the things that um, engage you, whether that's mentoring younger colleagues or whether that's um, giving back in a different way? But both sides, I think, are, are somewhat kind of reluctant to, to go there at the, at the minute. Um, I think also just to, to Wendy's point that um, this this is a whole kind of um, initiative also needs funding and we've seen within employers particularly there's been a huge slash in HR teams in the last um, 12 to 18 months training budgets have been have been um, cut substantially and what that has meant is that they're focusing a lot of their kind of employer budget on um, early careers um, uh, as, as a focus as, and also DEI budgets have been slashed as well in the last kind of 12 months so employers aren't necessarily funding this as a conversation as well um, I, I suppose just finally to Wendy's point that it isn't just about I suppose a, a work and career conversation obviously life is complex after 50 and therefore employers being able to support individuals with having a transition plan for what it's going to look like for perhaps the next 10 20 30 40 years um, and, and understand and from an empl you know, employee perspective understanding that it's not just about how you work it's how you're going to fund that length of retirement what you're going to do how you're going to remain connected with your community what are the things that are going to kind of keep you engaged and happy in, into retirement so we see that it's, a, it's not a, it's a complex problem that's not kind of um, not one-sided 
I mean, just briefly, just very briefly to add, I, I think it is important to recognise in this conversation the huge and important protections that the Equality Act brings for older workers and that if there are challenges in workplaces of people being concerned about having conversations because of those provisions, it doesn't feel to me insurmountable to, um, to resolve them with some decent training and some clear guidance because it, it shouldn't be um, a piece of legislation that prohibits people having conversations about how to support older people to remain in and progress in work. And there's nothing on the face of the legislation that I think would you know, prevent people from having sensible conversations of the sort that we're all talking about. Natalie. Uh, so can I just pick up on a couple of things that you said, uh, specifically about HR and diversity and inclusion budgets being slashed. Is that having a disproportionate effect on women? Yes, I believe so, actually. I do, I do believe that. So we see that, um, that returnership programmes aren't as well funded as they, they previous were, that women return to programmes particularly. Um, we also see that um, you know, the phenomenon of quiet quitting particularly is impacting women. Um, you know, post post fifty, um, they are in that sandwich generation of having to um, look, perhaps have caring responsibilities up and down, um, and therefore without sufficient kind of support from an employer, um, sometimes it just feels too much, and therefore they are leaving the work workforce. Um, we do. The, the, I suppose the good news are there are some fantastic employers out there that we are working with who do support women um, through this kind of phase of life with flexible menopause policies, um, um, introduction of um, greater provision of carers' leave, whether that's grandparents' leave or short-term care leave if they have caring responsibilities for elderly relatives. Um, but there is more to do. And what we absolutely need, need, do need to do is showcase those, those examples um, and call out the best practices so that other, other employers can see that it is possible it, and that actually there's a huge amount of benefit of retaining both men and women workers in the workforce for longer. And have you yet seen any uh, difference since the, uh, I'm going to say recruitment, I don't think that's the right word, of Helen Tomlinson as the government's workplace uh, menopause champion? Um, I suppose it's difficult to unpick what the benefits of, of what's been, because I think the menopause, as a zeitgeist, has, has raised in the last kind of two or three years. There's been a lot of media kind of attention on it. And I think from a, a UK perspective, I know that we, we work with global corporates and, um, you know, US, France, Spain, Spanish clients look to the UK and think, actually, you're way ahead in terms of your ability to have this as a conversation in the workplace. So I think that's, that must be applauded. Um, but I, I suppose it's difficult to see the trickle down from an individual initiative so sorry it's not a very clear answer no okay thank you it gave us an idea kim thanks chair and good morning panel i have got a couple of questions on economic inactivity and occupational health my first question is to jonathan so at the start of 2023 there were 412,000 more economically inactive people between the ages of 50 and 64 and i want to know whether you agreed with the tuc's analysis that um that was due particularly to um ill health since the pandemic and could you just say a little bit about intersectionality and whether that is um, impacted if you're black old and a woman sure so What's really interesting is that these, this economic inactivity category, the variable is terrible because it's mutually exclusive. You can't be retired and inactive due to ill health. But lots of people retire because they have ill health, that sort of thing. So like last night on Newsnight, they were quoting these statistics. They said, you know, X percentage are retired, X percentage are ill health. The ill health is bigger. But actually, these things interact, and, and the data is not great at that. Um, another interesting thing, there was a Lord's Economic Affairs Committee um, looking at where have the workers gone since uh, the pandemic. And I worked with some of the clerks, and we found that about 50% of the increase in inactivity could be explained just by demographic change. So people are more likely to be inactive when they're really young, because usually they're inactive due to student, and when they get older, inactive due to retirement and sickness. So, you know, I don't, I don't think the statisticians have done a very good job of quantifying. No, that headline number doesn't necessarily tell us the extent to which that is driven by um, simply just by um, ill health. Um, now, in terms of intersectionality, um, you're absolutely right. And I think that the, um, this is a, a good place where research gets more attention now. One thing that's been terrible for the last six months is that the Labour Force Survey, from which we do a lot of our analysis on this, has uh, the micro data has not been available to researchers like myself. And it's actually just been published now. Um, and that's because the response rates for the Labour Force Survey went from about 50% to 15 in 10 years. It just 
tanked, um, which is just surveys all over the shop. No one wants to answer the surveys and give feedback anymore. Um, so that's made, certainly I'd say the last six months has been a dearth of good research on the causes. And so you can find some fantastic uh, studies by people like the Health Foundation and the IFS, and, but you'll, you'll notice they're all sort of six months out of date. Um, but that microdata is really important because it has variables like ethnicity and gender and economic inactivities. It allows you to look, and we know um, that intersectionality is important and that if you are not from a majority ethnic background, you're going to have more disadvantages in, uh, in the labour market, more likely to be unemployed. And so, um, yeah, it, that's, that's how it interacts. And on, on all those things you said, if you're black, if you're a woman and you're older, then it's kind of compounding the disadvantage. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, next question to Wendy. Um, Wendy, could you say um, something about what level, what types of ill health contribute to these higher levels of I economic inactivity due to your research? Gosh, I mean, it, it's, it's very, very broad. But I think the, the main areas with musculoskeletal and, and mental health problems are still probably the biggest um, contributors. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we have, we, I absolutely agree with Jonathan, we, we lack reliable evidence. Mm -hmm. uh, one statistic you might have heard um, bandied about recently is, you know, one in 10 women um, leave their jobs and because of symptoms associated with menopause and don't feel, you know, that they're supported. That's not very accurate. We're, we, we, are, we are really needing much more accurate data around lots of areas. What we have found from our own research is that, interestingly, lots of these um, health problems, whether they say they're musculoskeletal, whether they're mental health problems, whether they're going through, you know, something that's associated with a particular phase of life, they do compound in sleep issues. And I think sleep is one of the big um, hidden health issues that that um, is probably facing us all, to be honest, as a society, but particularly seems to um, you know, work against the, the health for older workers and, the, and, and being able to um, have meaningful sort of work, working lives and pulls people out. But that is from qualitative research. Yes, it's from large scale qualitative research, but we really do need, um, we really do need better data on a, on a national level. If I can just use, I mean, I keep coming back to menopause as an example, but the main surveys don't have questions about menopause. And even the UK Biobank survey has one question, had menopause, yes or no? So, you know, that's that's the that's the level of data that, that we're working at um, for just one one aspect of health that may, may affect, um, a, you know, a, a proportion of our older workforce. You, you touched earlier on the fact that um, economic inactivity for older people was an homogeneous group and that, you know, um, there were difference depending on whether you were blue or white collar worker. So I wondered if you can just touch on that a little bit and maybe say something about um, what employers could do to um, improve um, workers staying in the workplace. Absolutely. Yes. Again, I would I would love to have, you know, the, the large scale statistical data to give you. I don't have it because of the reasons we mentioned before that the data are not, not being collected in sufficient detail. But it, uh, it's very much there's well, where we've seen the celebration of more older workers, particularly pre-COVID, perhaps staying in work longer or even returning to work, being kept maybe on a consultancy basis. It was very much white collar workers. So, again, those that probably employers had invested in. And this is where. If I can just maybe backtrack a little bit, we talked earlier about the business case. This is where the business case maybe have to be careful because I think it's easy to get a business case for these for these um, people that employers have invested in. They've invested in their training and their development. Um, they're high skilled. Um, those are those in the main are also those that enjoy better health, not exclusively, but in the main we know there's a, there's a health benefit there, and they're the ones that perhaps are are less falling under the radar than the, the, the blue collar workers, the ones that are more precarious occupations that employers perhaps have not invested in. Um, they're not paid as highly. They have fewer choices. They tend to suffer more health problems. And then they're the ones that really drop out of the labour market that, that we're seeing in these um, economic activity categories. Uh, in terms of, of, of what we can do, uh, one of the, the interesting outputs from our, our Shaw project is that working, we worked, we, we not only interviewed about 150 uh, workers over 50 in different sectors, interestingly, including self-employed, which we've not talked about, which is kind of a big and growing category for older workers. But we, we interviewed in four different sectors, different types of jobs. 
And um, we also then followed uh, just under 50 of those up for a year. And each participant wore a wearable device and collecting the usual information on physical activity, sleep, uh, temperature, etc. They also filled in questionnaires, self-report questionnaires on a monthly and weekly basis on their smartphones. So we've got really rich data um, going through for a year. And what we're finding is that people actually don't really understand their health. And that's partly because, um, they're, they're, again, there may be, you know, ignorance, but very often people are just getting on with their lives and don't really, they, they may know that they're experiencing particular symptoms or they do know they're experiencing particular symptoms. They may have had a particular condition diagnosed, but understanding how that relates to their work and the rest of their life, um, we don't have the opportunity. So we're actually developing a, an app. Uh, which is partly aimed at individuals helping them to review and reflect this information, but then um, help to, to them to have these conversations with employers that we've talked about earlier in this session, and also to help individuals take advantage of what employers offer. Because I think as Natalie was saying, there's some really good employers out there who do offer quite a bit. But if you don't know what perhaps you need, how do you take advantage of what your employer is offering? So helping people to understand better um, their health needs, how they inter intersect with what they need from work and what they might need from their employer, and then can better take better advantage of what their employer is offering is a key way, I think, of keeping people falling out of the labour market and into economic activity. Sorry, that was probably a broader answer than to your specific question, but I hope it was helpful. Yeah, thanks, um, Wendy. But uh, during your research, have you come across any good examples of best practice in terms of occupational health? And do you think that the government needs to do more in terms of occupation health for older workers? Yes, I'd be very interested in, in um, the opinion of other panel members in this as well, um, is that I think particularly the insurance industries are quite, quite far ahead in this because they, yes, I can see Natalie nodding. Uh, they get that because they are obviously doing this, this work. It's, it's their core business, isn't it, with the wider population. So I think some of our um, you know, insurance um, employers are good individually, but also the Association of British Insurers as, as an umbrella organisation is trying to work and, and to, to highlight on, a, on an industry basis the good work that's done. At the other, that lots of they tend to be bigger employers. They tend to, again, be, be working with mainly white collar. But interestingly, at, at the other end of the spectrum, there, there are some smaller organisations and some organisations that are working with um, you know, a whole range of workers, including blue collar. So Bab Babcock, Babcock, sorry, International um, Engineering, who was one of our, our companies we worked with, they're doing some fantastic work raise, raising awareness with, for example, their mainly male um, shop floor welding workforce, which is really good. But SMEs very often are doing the right thing. They don't necessarily know they're doing the right thing. And we come to talk to them, they say, um, you know, uh, we haven't got we haven't got HR resources. We haven't got the money to do a lot of training development, but almost because they've got the good relationships. And I think, you know, that's been a theme, isn't it, so far this morning, is that having these good and open um, communicative relationships is absolutely key. And we've seen those better in SMEs and, and that can work very well, even though they don't have official yeah. policies or indeed huge resources in place. Thanks, Wendy. Question to Jonathan. You know, we talked about people leaving um, the employment market due to ill health. You know, how many do you see returning back to um, the employment market? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think this is one of the big concerns, right, is that um, what you, you need to focus on isn't just um, people coming back in, but people not leaving in the first place. And the, the reason you want to focus on not leaving in the first place is because it's such an issue getting back into work. Um, there was some, there's obviously some sort of methodological problems in trying to get a, a, a handle on this, but the ONS did a specific survey um, sort of during COVID called the Opinions and Lifestyle Survey of over 50s, in which they asked about returners, people who had left work and would like to return. Um, they did ask them what would make them return, but they also asked them what the reasons were that they left, and I jotted them down. So 24% said to retire, 17% for a lifestyle change, 17% um, because of the coronavirus pandemic, 17% uh, because of redundancy, and 15% because of stress. Um, I think that stress is something that's under, uh, under diagnosed and under tackled and focused for um, employers. Uh, and if you've had a negative experience 
and that's forced you to leave the labour market. Maybe people are doing it at an age that they think, oh, maybe I can tie myself over, um, particularly if you're sort of 55 and you can draw on a private pension, you might say you've got the means. Um, you know, I spend a lot of time looking at a lot of data, but some of the most interesting things that I find uh, the most insightful place sometimes is just looking at the comments on, um, on the Times to articles about economic inactivity of older workers. And, uh, you know, b because people are just so willing to share their personal experience about why they've left work. And it's quite miserable to see how many people have just had a, a terrible time in their jobs. And I think that that can sometimes be enough to put people off trying again. Tim, did you want to bring Nicola in? Yeah, yeah. I was, well, I was going to bring in Nicola then anyway in terms of, you know, the, the government are looking at a, a range of different um, options to try and encourage people back in, into um, the workplace. And I just wanted to know from your point of view how effective it was and whatever point that you wanted to raise as well. I'll Thanks so much. Question. Um, I mean, I suppose just to go back to where Jonathan started on what we think is happening with the economic inactivity data, we have a slightly different view to the analysis that um, CIPD set out because I, I think that it's pretty unequivocal in the LFS data that there is a very large and new problem and growing problem for older workers who are experiencing ill health to the extent that they're unable to work to a much higher extent than has previously been the case um, in our economy. And we did analysis that looked um, across three years of LFS micro data um, at workers aged between 50 to 65. And it shows that the number of people below state pension age who have retired is now at levels that are below where they were at, um, before the pandemic. But the number who are out of work because of ill health is 700,000 higher. Um, so it's, it is a, a very large problem and it is a problem that has expanded since, since the pandemic. Um, you know, we've got one and a half million men and women now between 50 and state pension age who are um, out of work because of, because of long-term sickness. And for those individuals um, and for their families, the ramifications of that are, as I'm sure you can all understand, really, really substantial. Um, we had a look yesterday at just the most recent data for 2023, the third quarter data, about what's happening in terms of the proportion of older workers who are inactive and why. And that shows that, you know, in 2019, we had 33% of economically inactive older workers said that they were inactive because of long-term sickness. That's now up to 40% by 2023. So of those who are inactive, an increasing proportion are saying that it is because of, of ill health. Um, so there's a serious problem and a structural problem that um, is growing mm -hmm. and, and we are quite concerned about um, ensuring, is, um, ensuring that it's addressed. I think that the other part of our analysis that I wanted to flag to you is that when this a very, very strong occupational and also race um, cut across across what these across what these trends are showing firstly um, one of the most significant factors affecting whether or not someone is likely to be out of work because of ill health is the occupation that they are doing perhaps not surprising but i don't think it's discussed enough people in low paid occupations cleaning care retail physically demanding occupations working with heavy machinery or skilled um, trades far higher proportion of um, inactivity due to ill health amongst economically inactive people um, so the occupational groups with the highest proportion of inactivity because of ill health are process and plant machine operatives, 46% um, in that group, or people on elementary occupations. And whereas if you look at um, people who are economically inactive and were previously in a professional role, it's a far, far lower proportion of people who say that they're now economically inactive because of ill health. So just important to remember who is being affected by this trend. It's primarily people in low wage, low skill jobs who are now finding that they can't get back into work because of their health. Um, and then when you look by race, there are real big differences again in terms of comparing white and, and BME populations. And again, the proportion of economically inactive BME men who say they can't work because of ill health is eight percentage points higher than it is for white workers. Um, and for women, um, again, it's marginally higher than it is for, for white women. So there is a race divide and an occupation divide in terms of who's being affected. And the effect is, and the effect is significant. And you know, in our view, the primary cause is the lack of access to, to decent health care. You know, and it's, I know that's not perhaps the remit of this committee, but I don't think we can discuss the issue without discussing you know, a waiting list of 7.6 million people, 3 million plus people waiting more than 18 weeks, and a really substantial surge
surge in post-pandemic ill health amongst low wage, um, more likely to be black than white workers. Uh, you know, the key response to that challenge is really acting on getting more people access to the healthcare that they need. So I, I just think it's impossible to discuss this topic at the moment without being really clear about the scale of the structural challenge that is facing um, people from those backgrounds in low wage jobs and the scale of the difference in people's health that, that we've seen over the last few years. I think it's really important that you um, point out that, that, that the issues that intersectionality has, because I think Wendy pointed out that um, the high percentage of people leaving um, work was due to mental health and multiple, you know, uh, skeletal issues, yeah. or yeah. you know, arthritis and what have you. And it's those people that are working in those low-paid um, um, jobs that would find themselves suffering as a result of some of those um, health conditions. And I, when we looked yesterday again briefly at the sorts of conditions people are reporting across that group of economically inactive older workers, and it is very, very broad. It's back problems, it's chest and breathing, it's diabetes, it's progressive illness, it's circulation. Yes, there is a large number of people reporting mental health, depression, but an equally large number reporting other physical health problems as well. So, um, you know, while I agree, you know, the comments in the Times are, are useful and instructive, I think they also, we have to be clear that they reflect the experience of a particular demographic, perhaps, of people. And it's important to remember there's a lot of other people um, with physical health problems and mental health problems that they aren't getting care for, whose views and experiences perhaps aren't being reflected as widely. In, um, in some of the mainstream in some of the mainstream debate. I mean, you asked me the actual question was about the government's response. Um, I mean, I suppose you know there's some positives in terms of the direction of travel. Yes, you know, providing um, people with more access to talking therapies. Yes, you know, increasing access and universal support and support for people. Those are positives. But you know. We are, um, as I would expect you would imagine, not surprised to hear, opposed to the reforms the government's proposing to the work and capability assessment. We think that's just going to remove um, support from people who are out of work and can't move back into it um, and need that money to live. And more widely, we just don't think it's substantial enough and it doesn't meet the scale of the challenge. You know, many of the measures are not in and of themselves objectionable, but they are nowhere near significant enough to address the challenge of the sort of scale that I set out, which, you know, has at its root huge NHS waiting lists, big reductions and lack of support in terms of the access to work budget to support employers to get the um, improvements they need to support people with ill health at work, you know, not enough change on, on flexible work, too many bad quality jobs. So there's, you know, there's a bigger agenda that I think needs to come into play if the challenge of supporting more people um, out of economic inactivity with ill health back into work is to be meaningfully addressed. In your opinion, you do believe that the um, government has recognised those um, um, levels of inequality in the sectors that you've just mentioned in terms of some of the um, initiatives that they're looking at? I don't think so. And I think also sometimes the rhetoric is unhelpful because it suggests that, you know, people are making choices or people are, you know, not bothering to try hard enough and people should just, you know, give it a bit be a bit more ambitious and I, I don't think that recognises the scale of the realities of some of the ill health that people are experiencing and the problems that they are facing getting access to health care. Thanks um, Nicola. Natalie, um, one of those um, advancements is um, returnships and I know that you've expressed some concern about um, those. Can you just say a little bit about that and some of your concerns and issues? Yes, I suppose so that we um, we would like to hear more from the government, I suppose, about the over 50s returnership programmes that it announced. Um, we feel like it's gone a little quiet. We feel that actually the onus has been put on employers to kind of um, shoulder the, the, the access to these. Um, we do think they're hugely impactful um, and being able to support um, over 50s from lots of different backgrounds um, to reskill and it doesn't necessarily need to be kind of formal education I know you, you cited the example of, of a three-year degree but you know even a, a 12-week course in data, um, digital literacy um, or an opportunity to understand kind of a different area of, a, of employment that they haven't explored previously is hugely impactful um, and I suppose as I said earlier um, you know the, the employers are willing um, we believe that there are 
are um, people out there who want to go back to work. We do believe that, we, and we, want, we advocate for um, retiring the, the concepts of retirement. We want people to extend their, their working lives, but they need support. And, and I suppose I'm, I'm really acknowledging, I suppose, of what Nicola's saying around the fact that it, it is, um, it's not a case of just being, you know, being a little bit more ambitious. You know, there are some systemic issues here that um, people have to get over. Um, but those returnerships programmes, if they can be funded and paid, is key. Because, because you know, as I said earlier, life is complex after 50, and expecting somebody not to um, to go on a free internship and, and not have any income for 12, 15 weeks is, is just not um, not credible for, for many. So I suppose more, more focus on returnerships and what and what the government can do to support will, will be greatly welcomed. I mean, just on that very briefly, when um, we were preparing for this, the latest press I found on returnerships is that they're not going ahead now. I mean, they seem to be announced, but there's various press coverage from the end of last year suggesting they're not happening and that what all that's going to happen is existing support for over 50s is going to be rolled into a sort of new package. So I, I, I don't, as I understand it, the programme doesn't actually exist. Mm. Maybe we need Thank to you. Yeah. That's panel. Thanks, Chair. That's to know. Thank you very much. Uh, Natalie spoke earlier about quiet quitting and maybe um, I, I want to go a little bit further into that so I'm thinking about what some people might call forced retirement and I'm wondering how common you believe it is for older people to be forced into retirement into stopping work either from some kind of sense of, of a duty to make a, a space for younger workers um, or because they don't feel that they are valued and appreciated um, or supported enough at work um, I wonder, um, maybe I'll go to Wendy on this first. Wendy, you know, is this something that you recognise as a concept, um, something that you think is happening? Um, and you know, if that is the case, what, what do you think should be done by employers and others to try and deal with that? Yes, absolutely. And I think it's it's much more subtle than um, you know. I think as you've alluded to in your question, than than overt, you know, explicit uh, age discrimination. Although that still happens, uh, we only need to look at case law that have come up from um, you know, some of the, the tribunal decisions at University of Oxford, my own profession is a good case in point, uh, where there have been successive cases that have gone through. And, and in each case, you know, the, the employer is testing whether or not they can, um, you know, they can ask um, or um, force somebody to retire at a particular age as a um, you know, un under the, the exemption allowed in the legislation. And they keep coming back, they keep losing. Um, I, I always say when I'm talking to my students, you know, w w would employers be doing that if it, if it was a case on race discrimination, for example? So I think, you know, going back to, again, where we started from about, you know, some some ways in which age discrimination might be different from other protected characteristics, I think does um, allow, it allows in the law, but it also allows in the, in the um, sort of the, the, the culture to um, have more, more direct, um, uh, you know, forcing people to retire. But I think the majority of that is more subtle. So it still operated where there are three, three things like voluntary severance or voluntary redundancy agreements, which are subtly or not so subtly targeted um, at, at, at older workers. It happens, as you've alluded to, and I know I've seen in some of the, the evidence submitted to this inquiry, that um, the older workers themselves feel that they're bed blocking or job blocking. And, and that is very real, and that's come up through through a lot of the research that we've done qualitatively. That is particularly gendered. Uh, women are more likely to say that than our men. And uh, I think in, in particularly pre-COVID, when we had a lot of attention focused on, on you know, the, the lost generation of youth uh, unemployment, there was a real sort of feeling, I've got to go to make way for a younger worker, otherwise they, they, won't, they won't have the opportunities in life. Um, I think it's also um, it's also seen uh, indirectly through the lack of training and development opportunities. Again, we spoke about earlier, but if we have it, it stands to reason that if you have an older worker less likely, say, to train, I used an example on a new IT system, then their skills are less relevant, and then they, they become they can become um, more uh, susceptible to to a compulsory redundancy scheme, for example, because their skills aren't as relevant. I think the key that, that we do see is that the cases um, that, you know, are still underrepresented when it comes to tribunal. And maybe maybe Nicola might want to comment on that. And and again, um, that is for, you know, it, it, we're looking at groups here that really lack, lack sort of power in, in the labour market. And, you know, again, this I've found in our own research very heavily gendered that, um, you know, older women are more likely to accept their fate. 
uh, at this. And I think that's part of the reason that we don't see cases. And because, you know, we know that um, we had Nicola argued very eloquently uh, a moment ago about, you know, the, um, the, the intersection with those that are, are have, have fewer choices in life, have, you know, maybe, um, you know, less, less room to manoeuvre and less room to even to take a case to a tribunal, that they are underrepresented as well. So undoubtedly it goes on, but we don't know the extent to which it goes on. But I think we do know the mechanisms through which it goes on. And those are varied. They're both indirect, they're both direct. But I think to summarise, the majority of them are indirect. Um, and, and also I've seen these around health conversations as well. Maybe it's better you just take some time away. Once that happens, everything we know, people are not likely to get back into employment. Thanks very much for that. Um, I wonder if I can put the same question to Natalie. Um, our research found that 30% of those that retired felt forced to do so. So whether that's um, perception or reality, they left the workforce feeling that um, there were no more options for them in, 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 with that employer. Um, so maybe they ha maybe there is a level of internalised stereotype, maybe it's also the, cu the culture of the organisation. Um, from our, we've also found that one in four workers aged 45 or over have been subject to negative comments about their age. So, um, not necessarily, it's, it's not, as, as you said, um, um, to reinforce what Wendy said, it's not necessarily all overt, but there's a slowdown in, I suppose, attention on employers' pleas over at the age of 50, whether that's promotion velocity, lack of training, lack of um, offering of different opportunities to take on new projects, <coughs> some aged stereotypes that are perhaps inherent in the culture that aren't challenged, so comments like, when are you retiring? It seems to be an acceptable question to ask, but it wouldn't be an acceptable question to ask in, in relation to any other um, intersection. Um, so whilst employers might not be actively trying to force individuals to retire, I suppose the backdrop of these kind of cultures are in, meaning that people are leaving the workforce early and, and, they're doing, and they're going from kind of quiet quitting all the way up to kind of active rebellion and no longer, you know, and, and um, you know, within the engagement surveys kind of scoring the employer poorly and we see that crashing in, um, in the data when, when employers are sharing that with us. Um, so we, we also see that, I suppose it's also, you know, there's not the data out there, I suppose, there's inadequate data to understand kind of what the reality is in terms of the, the percentage of the workforce um, who felt forced to retire. Um, but, you know, from our research, um, we found that only 6% of employers have any staff aged over 70. And, and while some of that will be obviously optional retirement, there will be a level of in, involuntary in there as well. That's interesting. Thank you for that. Maybe go to Nicola and, and Jonathan now just to develop that question about data that you've raised there. I'm, I'm wondering what data exists in terms of how many retired people feel that they were forced to employment. We heard a little bit about that. I wonder if, if there's more there and if there's a, a, a way of getting more of that data and more accurately in your view. I mean, I think, you know, that would be, Jonathan may know of survey data, I, I, I don't know offhand of a particular survey that's been done of um, of people who have retired, but I know that our reps do raise with us that, you know, they see day to day in, in workplaces that employers can use, for example, performance management processes to set unreasonable expectations and then lead to people feeling as if they are, you know, forced out of work on performance grounds when it's actually an attempt to sort of push them into early retirement. So we know anecdotally that these sort of things are happening and a proportion of people will be will be affected by them. I mean, Wendy raised the point about how people get redress and what the remedy is in that sort of situation. Um, and, you know, our, our concern about the tribunal route at the moment is sort of twofold. Firstly, that there's an enormous backlog. Um, mm. So it can take several years for someone to have a tribunal heard at the moment. Um, that's an issue across a whole range of areas, but particularly pertinent here. Um, you know, you, you simply don't have any redress if that's the challenge you're facing. And if you're an older worker coming towards the end of your working life, um, the time pressure is clearly important. Um, and, and also the government is proposing to reintroduce fees for employment tribunals that just came out a few weeks ago. We think that would be a really retrograde step. It's an approach that's previously been um, overturned at the Supreme Court and we think that the government should think again about that approach and so does a coalition of over 40 um, organisations involved in access to justice. So that would be another barrier um, for older workers trying to seek redress to that sort of behaviour. I think the third thing I'd say just on this topic is it's really important to think about choice because of course some people want to retire early but can't but can't afford to. Um, so particularly low wage 
workers who haven't been able to save into a workplace pension, who are less likely to be enrolled in auto enrolment because they're below the ten thousand pounds earnings threshold. Um, there'll be people who simply who would love to retire um, at an earlier point in time, but are having to work longer and longer. And particularly as the state pension is set to move to sixty seven in twenty twenty eight, I think that's going to become a growing problem for larger numbers of low wage um, low wage older workers as well. They don't have the choice on when they would um, prefer not to be working anymore. Okay, and the same question, Chief. Um, so I, I, there's some interesting data. I looked at industries and age structure, and I'm always kind of blown away, actually, how age and gender segregated the UK labour market is. Um, there are jobs that older people tend to do, jobs that younger people tend to do, uh, and men and women is probably a bigger split. But if we take an industry like hospitality, for example, the average age is 35, and about one in five people are aged over 50. Whereas agriculture, it's uh, over 50% are over 50, and the average age is 48. Uh, and you know, then there's a range of sectors in between. So I think the UK economy is probably well structured to facilitate working um, into one old, older ages than other economies. We're sort of 80% services and um, less of less kind of more physical work. Um, but it's, it's quite interesting to consider that there probably are two groups of people um, who exit the labour market early. There's those who um, do so because they have the means, and, and I think that perhaps maybe because it's a difficult thing to discuss, but there are, uh, that's a substantial number of people who have um, uh, you know, significant private pension savings, uh, very large house price appreciations over the last 10 years, and all these sort of things that buffer and make uh, retirement comfortable, versus those on lower pay uh, who haven't been able to save into workplace pension and perhaps want to retire sooner. Um, I also think there's some interesting data around, um, I've looked at the hours that people work and the hours that they want to work. And as people get older, there's a big um, change between, there's a big gap between the two. So lots of older people would like to work fewer hours, and this is from the Labour Force survey, and then you ask them, would you like to, would you be happy to take a pay cut to do that? Uh, and that proportion increases as people get older. Now that's really weird because in a sort of open labour market, people should easily be able to match their hours with the, the hours they want with the work that with the hours that they do. So that suggests to me that there's a we're kind of presenting a lot of older workers, and it, it's significant. I've got the chart here. So for 60 to 64, there's sort of 16% uh, who would be happy to take a pay cut to work fewer hours. I think the problem is then you've got a binary choice, which is stay in work but be unhappy, or retire and be happy when actually there's a middle ground which is if you could reduce your hours and your pay happy to do that um, we'd have better matching and facilitate longer working lives um, so yeah there's interesting data out there but uh, actually I think there's big glaring gaps in our understanding of why people retire uh, and not sort of conclusive answers I think unfortunately I might have given the impression that I think that um, inactivity due to ill health isn't a problem actually what I kind of meant was we might even be understating it because there's a chunk that say they're inactive because they're retired, but a large number of them could be inactive, retired because they're ill. And actually, it's interesting, as people get older, they tend to jump from inactive sick to inactive retired almost arbitrarily at sort of 65 or whenever they can start drawing a pension because their mindset changes, but their actual material difference in their circumstances hasn't really... I'm going to ask Nicola to come back in. I wonder on flexible working, um, perhaps, oh. because I thought your comments earlier led uh, very neatly into what Jonathan said. If there was more flexible Thank working you. opportunity, then some of these difficulties wouldn't exist. I completely agree. And, and just to build on what Jonathan said, I mean, you know, I agree as well. The, the IFS report that originally raised this issue of people retiring early and choosing to retire early, you know, they subsequently found in a follow-up survey, didn't they, that it was, you know, a large number of those people who had retired had also experienced ill health. Um, but I think it's just, it's important to see the whole thing in the round, the large proportions of people who, who can't work because of ill health and are identifying as economically inactive. You add on to that, as Jonathan said, the people who are retired and also have ill health, the, the scale of the problem is 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 clear on flexible working yes i think there's a huge amount more that could be done here it's you know far too easy at the moment for people to say oh it can't be done the job has to be done people conflate flexible working with um working from home and actually you know flexible working is about saying what can you have flexibility in where a job is done in how a job is done and and when it is done so you know yes if you work in a shop it's not possible to work from home you can't have flexibility in your location but of course you can have location in how you work the hours that you are working 
Um, do you work always morning shifts? Is it possible for you to work um, a, a range of shifts? Is it possible for you to change your shifts with your colleagues? And you, also have fle you can also have flexibility in how many of those hours you work. Of course, it should be possible to have different sorts of shift patterns so that some people work fewer hours, some people work longer hours. And there is you know, lots and lots of evidence that in all sorts of occupations, there's a huge amount more that could be done with a little bit of thought, with support, I think, with seeing flexible working and the need for um, innovation in job design as you know an area of um, of almost industrial policy or an area of you know worthy of government support in the same way that some of our high value manufacturing um, needs gain support because you know it isn't no one's saying it's straightforward to take a factory production line and to think about how you might introduce flexible shifts to that factory production line while keeping the line going but it can be done and it can be done in an efficient way that gives you a more resilient workforce and that boosts productivity and helps you retain um, a workforce who will be happy to stay with you because they really value the reduction in hours that they've been able to get or the flexibility they've got in how in how they do their jobs so it's an area where I think there's huge untapped potential where we're at the beginning rather than the end of a conversation about how work could change in all sorts of ways and in all sorts of jobs um, and I think that stronger legislation is part of that but I think it's absolutely not the whole answer I think it's also about actual targeted support for employers to show how you can do this well and there are some employers who are doing it well in sort of unexpected um, in unexpected roles as well so I think there's a huge amount to build on thank you um, I see that Natalie and uh, Wendy want to come in so if I can ask you both briefly to come in so that we can yeah, very briefly I just I very very much agreed with a, a lot of um, what, what Jonathan was saying but I just just wanted to flag the idea that we've just seemed to conflate the idea that retirement equals happiness and that, that you get to your end of your working life and suddenly that you know you 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 become happy because you're no longer working and and what we hear from our life redefined members which is our um, free over 50s platform is that actually there's somewhat of a retirement rainbow so they, what you think you need, you've got a date in mind, you've got a kind of a point or a, a value in terms of your pension part in mind, you reach that point and you have a great first 18 months because you do those things that you really need to do, spend time with your family, um, do all those things that have been on the list and, and you haven't had the time to do. But after 18 months, we do see that there is a dip in, dip in happiness, loneliness, connection, and a loss of that sense of community that is provided by work. Work is good for us. Um, and I think that we need to also remember that, that um, we, we want to be encouraging people to extend their working lives and to bring in flexibility so that that is possible so that you can continue to work in your 70s and 80s and that becomes the norm because it, there's a huge amount of benefits that work provides as long as it's not, you know, you've not reached the end of a career where you've done 40 years in a manual difficult job but can we reskill those individuals and support them into do something slightly different to use their skills in a different way? So I just wanted to make that point. Thank you. Thank you for that. And Wendy? Thank you. Briefly, it's two points related to sort of flexible working. One is we talked about um, the link between economic inactivity and, and health and the difficulty of maybe getting accurate uh, reasons for why people might have re retired early. I think another, another reason related to that, and it's a growing reason that I don't think we've enough data on so far, is grandparenting. And again, related to a structural issue, and that's the affordability of childcare. But we, anecdotally, we do have increasing numbers um, of older employees leaving uh, employment um, to, to take up grandparenting duties. And in, we did a, a study with Grandparents Plus a few years ago, the charity Grandparents Plus, which showed that many of those um, left employment completely because they couldn't get flexible working opportunities to do the, the grandparenting duties. So that's one aspect of flexibility. The other one is to come back again, perhaps full circle to where we started. I think it was Natalie mentioned in recruitment and the imagery that's put out there. Uh, we've done some work with Age Scotland at looking at flexible working policies uh, and these are all other employers based in Scotland many of whom are you know in international organizations and that actually flexible working brochures or websites tend to feature um, younger people and they tend to feature pregnant women so I think that's that's a quick win in terms of um, employers actually making sure that their material around flexible working is age inclusive and also, I think there is, alongside that, a campaign to say to empower older workers to ask for flexible working, because what we've found from our own work is that older workers are less likely to ask for flexible working, uh, and particularly less uh, older women are less likely to ask for flexible working. Many may already be working part time. And what the thing that comes back to me when we've interviewed people is that I'm lucky my employer allows me to do this. So there's a very, they're either not aware of the rights they have to ask for flexible working or further flexibility, or indeed don't feel that they can ask because they feel they're already lucky to be allowed to do what they do. So I think there's, there's some quick, 
quick wins there in terms of awareness raising amongst the older working population and also amongst the employers in the imagery that they, they use to promote their flexible working policies. Thank you very much, Wendy. Um, and a final question from me, just to, to Nicola. Um, the, the default retirement age was supposedly uh, abolished in, in 2011. We've heard evidence that forced re retirement does remain common. It's often considered legal by courts, uh, and obviously that's contrary to the um, policy intention, which was to extend working lives. I just wonder what the TUC's view on that is. I mean, we, su we supported the removal of the default retirement age. We think that, you know, if, if there's activity happening which is in contravention of um, the removal of that default retirement age, then we may need new approaches to address it. It's not an area where we've got detailed policy at the moment, but I think if, um, if there's a growing evidence that people are still being forced to retire at a certain age, then it may mean that a legislative solution is necessary to make crystal clear to employers that that is not an option that is um, that is open to them, to them anymore. I mean, you know, and then more widely, um, it's going back to that point I made previously that having removed the default retirement age doesn't necessarily give people control over when and how they stop work without the wider, you know the wider pensions improvements in particular that you would need to support that. If I may just say one final thing, which is building on what Wendy um, just said, I think the case that Wendy just set out there makes clear how important it is that um, jobs are advertised as flexible and that there is reference in job adverts to the availability of flexible working, because for all of the women in particular that Wendy was just talking about, if you don't see it in the advert, people aren't going to ask. It's all very well saying you can have it from the first day of the job, but how on earth is someone even going to think of applying for that job or think it could apply for them if they don't see it in the advert in the first place you're not going to rock up to a job interview and say oh hello I'd like to request flexible working please if you have no idea if you're going to be laughed out the park for suggesting it or if the employer is open to it at all so it's a small change and I think it would be really it could be potentially quite transformative in terms of how people start to think about work and how they start to think about the options there are for small flexibilities that can make big differences for people great place for me to finish thank you Lisa thank you so much um, questions I have are about more to do with the strategy uh, for longer working lives moving forward. And firstly to Nicola and Jonathan, uh, do the UK's demographics make a strategy on ageing and extending working lives imperative? And how can we ensure that extending working lives doesn't cause more inequalities in terms of people who have less finance having to work longer than others um, and uh, I suppose entrench the inequalities rather than addressing them properly. If we can start with Jonathan. Sure. Um, so the, the UK faces a similar challenge to most countries in the world which is that it is ageing and um, you know people need to extend their working lives. The, I think that like I said I don't I, I think that we are perhaps uh, better placed than other countries, particularly some countries in Europe. So there's some analysis um, from the FT, from Johns Burns Murdoch, you might have seen showing that inactivity rates um, increased during COVID. And for other countries, they um, sort of went back to where they were pre-COVID, but the UK sort of stayed elevated. But then if you look at the y-axis and realise that our inactivity rates for older workers are actually quite low compared to other countries in Europe and, uh, and at actually further afield as well. So I think the UK is well, um, to an extent, is well placed. Um, in terms of um, increasing inequality, I think a lot of the problem, a lot of the the challenge, I suppose, is it's a, a political challenge. So um, some of the things that might um, encourage people to work longer would be to increase the state pension age or to um, increase the age at which you can draw on a private pension. That's not necessarily an easy thing to do to the demographic of people that tend to vote in higher numbers, that sort of thing. Um, and that might be where a large part of the inequality comes from between you know, the professional class that have uh, access to funds and can retire at a reasonable age and those that have to work longer, um, perhaps longer than they would like to. Um, so, yeah, I think there is a challenge. The challenge is political. I'm not sure how you avoid entrenching inequalities. Um, a, a large part of why we have this problem is actually a good problem to have, which is that uh, people are just simply living longer. I think the problem is we're increasing our uh, lifespans, but not necessarily our health spans. Uh, and in recent years, with uh, the increase of sickness in, in the population in general, the UK seems to be just sickly on whatever measures you use, be it um, sort of uh, drawing disability benefits or just 
deaths. You know, that's quite an objective measure. The IFS did a report and they said, well, we could look at disability um, claiming or we could just use this really objective measure, how many people are dying, and it seems to be elevated. So that's, uh, that's a real challenge. It's a political challenge. The inequality thing, I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure how you tackle it. Actually, it's a, it's a really awkward question that a lot of people who are retiring earlier are some of the ones, uh, later, are the ones who might have the shortest life expectancy. So their sort of ratio of working to retirement years is the lowest. And, you know, that, that doesn't seem fair. I'm not sure how easy a challenge that is to, apart from, you know, there's, there's a kind of redistribution question there, I suppose. Thank you. And Nicola? Um, I mean, briefly, I'm, I'm sure it would make sense to think strategically about the you know, diversity that we've all talked about of the older workforce, the, you know, the structural and operational challenges that um, that group are facing in terms of their labour market prospects and their progression at work, and also to be really clear and you know, a really sharp piece of analysis looking at the inequalities um, and the intersectional inequalities faced by people within that group, um, I think could be a really useful tool because it would shine a light then, um, and then it's for government to decide what it wants to do right, as a policy response and which of those challenges it wants to prioritise in terms of um, in terms of its actions. But you know, if you were of a mind that you wanted to try and address the inequality between those in low-income jobs um, or between low-income paid women, for example, and you know, better paid professional men and women in terms of when they're able to choose to retire, well, then that would drive you towards looking at things around about the operation of auto-enrolment, around the employer contributions, around about an approach to the state pension age that would take account of whether people had to retire early because of ill health um, in terms of the age at which they were able to access the pension. So there are always policy solutions, as you will all well know, um, that will help to close inequalities and to move us towards a more equal society rather than one where inequalities are becoming exacerbated. But I think having that clear analysis and having um, a sharp focus on the scale of difference within this population group would be really helpful because, you know, a lot of the um, the narrative that comes from, from all sides, you know, about people's experience of older workers is, of course, affected by um, people's own personal experiences and by... Um, the sort of the press headlines of, of the day and when you look below that it's sometimes quite a, a different picture and I think that would be a good place to start with improving outcomes. Thank you so much. Um, my next question is to everybody and it's sort of um, built on what we've been speaking about and I'm wondering about in also addressing inequalities um, and sort of looking at human rights um, and the Equalities and Human Rights Commission in fact identified that flexible working options might be key to looking at some of these areas and, and I'm thinking about it in terms of facilitating longer working lives but also well-being I suppose across the lifespan and I wonder um, you're uh, nodding Natalie there so if you want to start yeah no problem. so I think um, some of our research shows that 61% of over 50s want a flexible role so to help them manage with life commitments so talking about earlier about some of the, the sandwich generation that particularly impacts women um, actually and it was not only was so the 61% is men and women but actually for women it's 25% higher than that because they they have they take on more caring responsibilities they still want to work but they also want to fulfill their family responsibilities as well um, so roles do need to be flexible as you kind of um, as you age um, and, and also need to take account of kind of unusual presence and, and leave requirements. So we call it spiky leave. So that, you know, the moment at which you've, um, you, know, you receive a call that your elderly, elderly mother's had a fall and you need to leave work and be away from work for three weeks. Um, employers need to take account of that kind of leave that's required for, for particularly for older work, workers. Um, we'd also, and I suppose it's a related um, challenge that, that relates to flexible working actually, is that we'd love to see a change in the apprenticeship um, levy approach so that that more accommodates um, for flexible roles because actually what we find is that it's difficult for individuals to do that that aren't working full time so I think that could actually add to the opportunity for reskilling older workers particularly. So flexibility is key. Um, and, and when we ask, and we, you know, this was a statistic that you were talking about earlier, that, that pay isn't the, the primary driver for over 50s in the, in the majority in white collar, in collar roles, um, but actually it's around flexibility, it's around connection, and it's around doing a role that gives back and has some purpose to it. Well, that's fantastic. Do you want to add something, Jonathan? Then I'll come to Professor Loretta. Uh, not only that, um, we released a report this week with uh, over 50s flexible working task force, and it, you know the main recommendation was calling for more flexible working. I I wrote a report on older workers where essentially I took every variable in the labour force survey that I thought would be interesting and cut it by age, including every 
form of flexible working. And um, yeah, it just really it stuck out to me that older, uh, you know, economists like myself, we like to look at revealed preference, not what people say, but what they do. And um, they tend to work higher rates of sort of part-time working, um, more working from home, but actually working from home exclusively sort of peaks in middle ages. Um, but, you know, the key thing is that there is this, when I talked about hours, works that people want to work and what they do, there's this residual unhappiness. And I say residual because a lot of them already do work flexibly, um, but there's clearly not enough because the gap between the hours you work and you want to work should be zero, especially if you're willing to take a pay cut to do it. So um, I, I, I think we just need to push much harder on the provision of flexible working, yes. Thank you so much, Professor Loretto. Yes. Thank you. Yes, I, I hope I heard your question. Um, OK, you're just slightly lower in volume. But I think I'm not going to repeat what I previously said about flexibility, you know, promoting, etc. But maybe a just slightly different um, aspect of flexibility, and that's self-employment, which I referred to briefly very earlier. Um, you know, self-employed older workers is the fastest growing category um, of, 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 of uh, in the self-employed uh, category, but also of, of work. And that, I think, is an area that, that we haven't, in policy terms, paid particular attention to. And, uh, you know, really understanding who these are, why why they work flexibly, and what we need to do to support that, that route. Because it is a route for flexible working and a route to potentially extending working lives that offers choice, control, some of the things that were the, the themes that have arisen today. In our, in our qualitative work, uh, where we interviewed about, it was about just under 50 uh, self-employed workers, it was really key that although their health was no better in objective terms than, than those that were in employment, they actually were much higher in terms of their motivation, their engagement, their satisfaction. And therefore, I think that that really was supporting their ability to work longer. I should say these were not, we deliberately chose a group of lower income self-employed. These were not, you know, sort of people coming out of the professional world and going into consultancy. These were people that had had, um, you know, low, low, low um, quite often low status, certainly low salary and precarious jobs and had then gone into self-employed. So I think that's an area that, that of flexible working that we should really be, be looking at in, in policy terms more than we have done so to date. Thank you so much. I know that um, from the work I've done on the disability all party group that people with disabilities also are going into self-employment much more um, and, and looking and I think it's it's linked with the flexibility and you know being able to adapt to their needs. Um, the final question uh, before we uh, finish up and head to Prime Minister's questions this morning if I start with you uh, Professor Loretto. Um, given all that we've spoken about today um, there is widespread support for a cross-departmental minister or um, statutory commissioner for older people and ageing um, to develop and deliver a strategy on ageing. So what would your view be on that? Yes, please, is my very short view. The reasons why I say that is I think it's been exemplified in this session today. Although this session has been talking about older workers, we, we you know, realise that actually we're talking about people and their lives and we've talked about health support systems. We've talked about, um, you know, childcare and how that influences older working patterns. Uh, I think this is absolutely, if there ever was a case for examining something in the round, then this is it. Because I think uh, hopefully what, what has come to you is that uh, we absolutely need to, to think about this as a series of linked um, issues, challenges and opportunities. It's not just an employment issue. Thank you so much. And Jonathan? Uh, yeah, I think that I think the UK uh, policy in general and worldwide is going to start paying a lot more attention to demography in the next five to ten years, and uh, it affects not just age. You know, we're talking about. I think there'll be a lot more attention on sort of uh, falling fertility rates and mm -hmm. less children and immigration, and these are all the different things that can uh, affect whether the population goes up or down, the size of the workforce goes up and down. They're the sort of policy levers you can flex if you want to um, hit goals like you know populating your uh, social care workforce and that sort of thing and um, I don't think the UK has great expertise in in you know demographic uh, transitions and understanding if you sort of google um, a, a master's in demography yeah, there's a couple of results there's a few quite niche institutions that do it but not so much for there's plenty more if you do ge geography and psychology that sort of thing so I think a dedicated minister is um, a good idea it puts attention on it but it's something that needs to permeate 
all parts of um, government and thinking, really. I find it a bit awkward because I talk about sort of interventions that you can do around employment policy, but actually I, I agree with Nicola that uh, sorting out the NHS and health is probably um, the biggest thing that you can do, and other things are um, pretty marginal compared to just um, trying to improve the health of the population. Yeah, th thank you. That's so helpful as someone who's done psychology myself rather than <laughs> demography. I'm one of the, um, the majority of the people you talk about there. But I know that we're doing a lot of good work um, with other countries like Japan looking at ageing and uh, workforce and policy. So I know that the ministers are working really hard on that. If I can come to Natalie. Um, yes, absolutely. So we've si signed the pledge from the Centre of Ageing Better to, in, in support of this. Um, and I, I won't repeat anything that, that Wendy said because I'm very much aligned with her view, but I suppose the only um, point I'd like to raise is that the, I suppose the Minister for, for um, Older People, you know, it's a huge age range to look after, you know, the 50s to 100s effectively, so a, um, a half a century worth of, of life experiences. Um, and therefore, we, you know, how do we ensure that the direct attention has been given in, in kind of proportion to those that have kind of health and housing needs in perhaps the over 70s, over 80s, and also about how we keep those kind of economically active in the 50 to 70 age bracket. So that's probably the only point I'd like to raise. Thank you. I fall into that bracket now, yeah. so I'm just paying close attention to everything you're saying. And finally, Nicola. Um, Yes, I, I, I think it, it sounds like a positive idea and, and I think thinking through the big challenges that our country's facing at the moment and the challenge of securing strong growth going forward, you know, perhaps focusing the work of such a programme on, you know, what is the work that could be done to ensure that, you know, older workers are able to maximise their labour market participation, um, you know, for the benefit of our economic growth and for the benefit of their household incomes um, would be would be no bad thing and would lead you to some interesting and positive policy challenges. I just wanted to say one final thing on um, this point about the quality of work that people are doing, because I think um, while I agree that very many people are at the moment moving into self-employment or into zero hours contracts jobs, because that gives them some flexibility and allows them to remain in work. My concern is that those jobs are also jobs that provide people with very little security, with no pension provision, with no wider workplace benefits, with no access to paid leave. What I think we need to see more of is employee jobs which have got flexibility with them. So it's not a choice for people whether you have the protections and benefits of being an employee um, or you have flexibility, you, you, should be able, you should be able to have both. We shouldn't be saying to our older workers, the only way for you to be able to retain some connection to the jobs market is to have a highly insecure, likely low-wage job where you don't get any wider um, employment benefits or protections. You know, half of the UK's employees don't have access to occupational health services at work at the moment. Um, if you're in a zero-hours contract or a self-employed position, you won't have any sort of access at all. We need more of the good quality flexibility um, and less of the highly insecure, precarious work. And the strategy would then look to address those issues? And well, if, if I was in charge of what it would look of, at, absolutely. <laughs> in terms of giving people opportunity and aspiration to be self-employed as well, perhaps, um, you know, the, looking uh, at, at how we can make the benefits linked with that as well more secure. Well, people want to choose self-employment and that's the right route for them of course that's a, you know a good strong trip and there's very many trade union members are self-employed not least in some of the entertainment unions um, but where people want to choose um, a flexible job you know my concern is to make sure that they're able to choose to find that within an employee position rather than finding that because they cannot find employee jobs that provide them with flexibility they have no choice but to look for more precarious employment. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can I thank all of our witnesses for giving evidence this morning? If there is anything that you feel we've missed or you wish to add in writing, please don't hesitate to do so. Thank you all. Order, order. The proceeding has ended. 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 The proceeding has ended.
The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.